Hello and welcome to Your VIDHS, a podcast brought to you by the Virgin Isles Department of Human Services, specialized in informing you on social services and programs we offer you to the people of the Virgin Islands. I'm Ryan Nugent, Director of Communications for the Department, and today we are discussing the USVI Medicaid program with the director of the program, Mr. Gary Smith, and the director of operations, Ms. Beverly Joseph. A quick description of these two. Gary Smith has been the director of the Medicaid program in the U.S. Virgin Islands for the last six years and has been a champion of healthcare initiatives within the Virgin Islands for over 10 years. He uses his passion, energy, and expertise to lead several key efforts, including Medicaid, HIV prevention, Ryan White, and ADAP programs. He was awarded a fellowship with the Medicaid Leadership Institution in 2020, the first individual selected from a U.S. territory, which he allowed him to continue to develop and bring resources to the territory. He also represents all five U.S. territories on the National Association of Medicaid Directors Board, where he focuses on setting strategic direction within Medicaid on behalf of his territory's colleagues. Beverly Joseph has worked for the government of the U.S. Virgin Islands for more than 17 years, currently as a director of operations for the Medicaid program, where she works with Director Smith to modernize and improve the quality of service to Medicaid recipients. Previously, she worked as Medicare Director out of the Lieutenant Governor's Office and as the Expansion Services Coordinator, where she was responsible for Medicaid benefits education, along with aiding with provider enrollment and on-island and off-island care. She was also the Chairwoman of the Government Employee Services Health Insurance Board of Trustees, working to deliver health insurance to over 30,000 government employees, retirees, and their benefits. You two do quite a lot. Welcome to the program. I'll take my breath now. Gary, how are you doing this morning? I'm great. I'm great. Thank Mr. you so Nugent much for joining yourself. us. Thank you for having me. Sir. I said all that. Can you just provide us a quick <clears throat> high-level overview of the Medicaid program for the people? Okay. So, um, again, thank you for having me. And, um, you know, glad to be here to talk about a very important uh, program which provides access to health care for our um, Virgin Island citizens. So the Medicaid program is a collaborative effort uh, with the federal government and uh, the federal agency um, centers for Medicare and Medicaid services, CMS, and the Virgin Islands government. So, you know, we have an established state plan which guides the program it's it's like your uh benefits package okay uh you know cigna has a benefits package our benefits package is is our state plan and um as of october 13th we now have uh, approximately 28,000 plus enrolled virgin oh, islanders wow. now prior to that Prior to the unwinding, we're now going through an unwinding phase or persons are beginning to perform redeterminations, which I will allow our policy and uh, operations expert, Beverly, you know, will speak to more to that. But we were at approximately 40,000, and that was back in April. So, mm. so since the, the, the um, uh, unwinding and the redetermination process started back, uh, we're almost to 28,000. We also have 1,357 uh, providers wow. enrolled with the program. Well, quick, provided. let me ask you. Providers are? Providers are physicians, hospitals, Great. Um, laboratories, um, pharmacies. All in due to helping out with the Medicaid yes, program. Yes, we even, we even have uh, air ambulance Yes. companies enrolled as providers. Yes. We have hotels enrolled as providers. So there are 1,357 of those, and 28% are here in the territory, and the other 72% are off-island due to all of the uh, hmm. members that we have to traverse off-island to obtain care that's not available here in the territory. Um, for fiscal year 2022, we paid approximately $133 million in services. Wow. That will change, however, because we, we still are crunching the numbers, yes. fi finishing out the, the fiscal year, which ends on sept September 30th every year. Um, we pay claims based on a federal Medicaid assistance percentage, or FMAP. Right. And those vary depending on the population that you enroll or belong to. For instance, a single adult 
we would pay a claim for a single adult at 90-10. For a child, our CHIP, our CHIP population, Children's Health Information Program, we pay their claims at 85-15. Mm. Um, Before we jump to the FMAP, because mm -hmm. that's an important formula that uh, I, would, I want us to break down later for the audience on how the federal share versus the local share and how that really helps us. Got it. But before we jump on that, I want to scale it back a bit and talk about mm -hmm. folks who are interested in joining. Ms. Joseph, talk to me a little bit about eligibility into the program because there's a, a, a conception that it's, it's quite difficult to get on Medicaid. What, what is the eligibility requirements, actually? Thank you for that question. For the eligibility requirements to join the program, one, you must be a U.S. citizen or you have been here five years. Mm -hmm. You are required to submit your birth paper, mm -hmm. your social security card, a valid ID, proof of your residence, um, WAPA bill, right. VIA bill, those information. If you are a senior, please submit all those documents as well as your Medicare card because we will also cover you for the buy-in program, which is awesome. So those retirees would not have to pay mm -hmm. for that Part B premium. The department will incur that cost as long as you're a member on the program. It is important to keep your appointment, submit all necessary documents when you are applying. The application is online, the checklist is online. Um, all members have the ability to walk into the office and drop it off, or you can submit it via the email portal. Mm -hmm. And it's best, yes, we have 45 days to complete an application, but you need to have everything in. Do not submit half of the process, which is the application and just a birth paper. We need the other information submitted with it. If you are a senior, your award letter from CMS, you get that every December it is sent to you. That's right. Walk that in, your bank information, so that we can see. Medicaid is income based. It is your resources. Unlike our counterpart, food stamp, they will deduct you yes. know, your light bill. They will do those. On Medicaid, we don't. It's on your resources that counts for your household income. Yeah. Now, about these eligibility requirements, because you know I visit uh, our local Medicaid offices and I talk to the beautiful young men and w w ladies that work there, and let's just clear something up. These are not <laughs> eligibility requirements that we set. No. Who sets these? CMS. Okay, so don't be calling and bawling down the girl <laughs> them down there telling them that they, they're taking benefits away from you, okay? Exactly. <laughs> right? Am I right? Oh, you are correct. I mean, but these are strict standards that we have to hold for the federal government, of course. Yes. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the pandemic because I know it changed the landscape throughout the states, throughout here, federally, locally. Congress made a lot of different mandates and took away some mandates. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about... All Medicaid recipients in the states and territories across now must renew, Correct. right? Beverly, how is this process going? And how is it impacting uh, the Medicaid members here? So it is impacting us because these recipients from the cut five hurricanes didn't have to come in and recertify. So that was two years we were recovering from that. Yes. And then here comes COVID. Right. That's another two years. So they did not have to do any recertification. They were automatically re-enrolled into the program. So now, with the emergency waiver lifted and gone, we are sending out the recertification in the mail. Yes. And we send it out 45 days to prevent you from having any lapse in coverage. And yes, we have been on calls. We are not responsible for the US Postal Service. So we send it out on time. But as you know, Mr. Nugent, the mail here has to go to Puerto Rico. It gets filtered. It's yes. sitting there until it's recome back here to the territory and then sent out in the member's mail pan. So there have been some laps. The team on both districts are working extremely hard to get those recertification done in time. It has been a very hard process because in one month, you may have over 1,500 people that needs to recertify. Right. And we have limited staff, but the staff is working extremely hard. Yes, they are. To get it out in time. Yes. So with that, we strongly ask that you come in. You know on your notice of decision, it tells you when your coverage is going to end. You can come in and request your recertification form mm -hmm. because it's generated in the system. 
and once you have received it, fill it out and send back all the supporting documents that is needed to process the claim to get ahead so there is no lapse in coverage. That's, that's, that's very important for them to know that things have changed, folks, and requirements and eligibility requirements sometimes step up in order to remain on the same program. COVID and the public health emergency caused a lot of waivers to happen because we were trying to bring down the endemic. But now that things are back into place, or as they say, back to square one, exactly. renewals are stepping back up. You get, you come to your mailbox, you see the periodical report. What's going to be one of the first steps that you do? So the periodical report is actually food stamp. Oh, uh, yes. So we have the, oh, you see the, re uh, the recertification. recertification. recertification so when report. they get the recertification, Yes. They are to fill out the information on it. If you have changes in your household, report the changes. If your phone number, your mailing address, because sometimes they don't even get the recertification because you have moved from one post office box to another and you have not made that change within the office. So we are sending to the information that you have on file. Right. So we have sent out posters. We have placed them throughout the territory with a QR code. So the members can scan and update. We have asked the providers when you have members come in and you seeing on the notice a decision is going to expire, encourage them to come to the office and update their information yes. so that there is no lapse in care. So when you get your recertification, fill it out. Make sure you put the correct phone number, your correct address. If you have an email address, please put it down so that we can make sure we cover all bases of communication so there is nothing lapsing in your coverage once you qualify. Yes, once, once you qualify. Um, I'm going to go and say another scenario. I'm a senior at home. Yes. Mobility is difficult. How do I apply for Medicaid if I'm in that situation? So if you're a senior, we ask you to put an authorized rep. You can have, whether it be a neighbor, it can be a, a close relative right. that you trust. They will fill out that form and they can come and apply on your behalf um, so that you can receive benefits. We work closely with homemakers. So some of them, they probably are on Meals on Wheels. They have homemakers that's coming to the home. They will address the situation and they do call our office and say, we have a member that we're servicing that we need them to get on Medicaid. We will provide the application right. and they will walk you through, fill it out and submit the information on their behalf. And they will be their case manager on top of the case. So we work hand in hand, the same thing with the Lieutenant Governor's Office, VI SHIP. Yes. Um, that office is where any retiree in stage renal or disabled individual will go to when they're on Medicare. But when you're on Medicare, you can be considered a dual eligible on our program. So you would have both yeah. and you can qualify. And you can qualify. And you can qualify. And again, when that office goes out and they see someone is struggling, medication, their access to care, they will also reach out to us to make them get an application and apply and see if they qualify. So we work hand in hand, the Absolutely. FQHCs. But a lot of the programs that's out here, even for providers, yes. will see a client and see they're struggling. So we reach out and we collaborate with a lot of our stakeholders. That's great. A lot of hands involved, a community Correct. involved. And if you know a senior out there and you can help them get them enrolled because they don't have access to it, please look, look into it as well. Director Smith, I want to talk about another aspect of um, ending up on Medicaid or temporarily entering up on Medicaid. There is a situation where I injure if I don't have any insurance whatsoever and I injure myself and I go to the hospital is there a way that I can get temporarily Medicaid temporary Medicaid in a, in a scenario like that can you tell me what it is and what it's actually called sure so you know an, another way or uh, alternative on getting into the program is um, hospital presumptive eligibility <clears throat> so um, back in um, 2014 uh, CMS, uh, part of the Affordable Care Act, passed um, uh, legislation, a, a final rule to allow hospitals, uh, health centers, our federal, federally qualified health centers, St. Thomas East and Fredericksted Healthcare, our two hospitals can offer you presumptive eligibility. Wow. Okay? And that's a 
self-attestation process. Right. In other words, um, there are some questions that will be asked and the application is supposed to be processed and performed real time. Yes. Uh, we've, we've provided, we provide training to, to the staffs of the hospitals and, and the uh, health centers annually on how to um, process those applications. Yeah. So, 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 so that is something that if you are uninsured, if you are uninsured, if you are uninsured, it's applicable for uninsured yes. persons and only. It's up to uh, forty-five days. So it's between thirty to sixty days. Okay. So, for instance, you present to the hospital or one of the federal qualified health centers or Department of Health clinics on October the fifth, and you are deemed eligible. Those benefits will go to the end of November thirtieth. Wow, yeah. it seems that it's a good step to tackle the uncompensated care that uh, takes care uh, that occurs at the hospital when patients come in and they can't afford to pay for it, and the hospitals take on that burden of a bill. Are you saying that Medicaid now provides hospitals with payments? Yes, that Ex that does that that those benefits. Yep are just as if you have a full determination of 12 months. Incredible. And then, and then we also encourage that you go through that process before the end yeah. of the presumptive eligibility yeah. benefits. So the USBI Office of Medicaid is, on one hand, providing that state, state insurance plan for its members, but also dealing with uncompensated care efforts at the hospital so that they are not underfunded in the situations of taking on the burdens of people who can't pay. That's amazing. And yes. I think that's a real yes. aspect well, of the program. You know, well, you know, as, as I open, you asked me, you know, to tell you uh, on a high level about Medicaid, we, we put $133 million into the economy. That's right. Okay. So, um, you know, our program, whether it be doctors getting paid, operations, medical supplies, exactly. pharmaceutical supplies, that money is coming from the efforts of Medicaid and poured into the. the and, that's, and, that's and, great and news. also, and also the the local government, Absolutely. you know, pays yeah. their part as well. Yes, um, you know, so it, it's 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 a program that's um, very beneficial to the territory, but also beneficial to our citizens because we're providing access to quality health care. And, you know, I will also share our program is a, one of the, um, uh, our rates that we pay providers. Right. We pay at 100% Medicare rates. Wow. My colleagues across the nation, um, you know, I, I, the highest rate that I know of that is paid it is at 85% right. of Medicare rates. So, 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 so we, we, we are very um, critical to, to, to the um, wealth and health of, 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 of the Virgin Islands Territory yeah. in terms of making sure that people have access to care, but then also, you know, generating economic, um, uh, contributing to the economy right. of, 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 of the territory. Of the territory, that's yeah. what's wonderful. And in so many ways now with the recent rule change with the FMAP as well, that will provide us more of a, of a gravitas of incentive from the federal government to help us as well, or is what you're saying? So, so, so you're speaking about the passage of the omnibus package back in December 2022. Correct. Where the VI and the three Pacific Island territories received a permanent FMAP, federal um, <coughs> Medicaid assistance percentage of 83%. In a nutshell, what does that tell you down to for us? So, so in other words, the federal government will pay $83 of every $100 that, that we spent on regular claims. Wow. So, so going back to, they will pay 90 cents on every $100 for a single adult claim. And for a, a, a claim for a child, they'll pay $85. For, for the age, blind, and disabled um, <coughs> population, depending on if you're a single adult, it's 90-10, or that, that it's, it's 90-10 for single adults, right. right? Okay. Okay, yeah, so, so, so those are the different FMAPs that, um, yeah. uh, that, that the program has. For operations, uh, the split is 50-50. Um, you know, any systems, enhancements, uh, we get 90% of a dollar from the federal government to, 
to enhance any technology. And after that, they, they will pay $75, $75 for every $100 for us to maintain that, that, that system. That's amazing. Let's talk a little bit about the future of Medicaid. Where do you see us in, as far as, after working and improving and the ability to advance the program, um, what do you see its outlook like in the, in the next few years here? So there, there are a couple of initiatives that, that, that we are currently working on. And um, you know, we just recently submitted a four-year strategic plan, which was required uh, by the omnibus package passed last, last um, December the VI and the three Pacific Island territories. And it's, you know, you, you hear me mention that a couple of times. So the insular areas uh, are, we're, we're not, we're all five U.S. territories and we're, we're in the same boat because right. our, our programs are capped. We, we're, our programs are not open-ended. My state colleagues, they can know that they're going to need $100 million next month. They can you know, complete a report, submit it, and, and they get access to that $100 million. So uh, we submitted a four-year strategic plan which outlined, um, you know, our plan in addressing program integrity, right. uh, workforce development, Medicaid financing, yes. and systems enhancements. So a couple of the system enhancements that we're going to be working on, which will assist in streamlining our processes is provider enrollment application where our providers will be able to enroll electronically. We will no longer have that manual process. Um, you know, there'll be a call center that they can contact, uh, electronic visit verification, which will help Beverly wow. and her team yes. verify our home care, home health, personal care attendance services program. Looking forward to that. Help help out with program integrity as well as, you know, verifying services performed, provided so forth and so on. And another piece that will help Beverly and her team is the citizens portal from our eligibility and enrollment system. We are going to uh, our members, our citizens will be able to apply online. Mm -hmm. They will be able to recertify online. So, so, so those are some of the things that, that, that we're looking towards. You in the also future. recently partnered with a pharmacy, a pharmacy benefits management firm. Yes. Right? yes. What, what does that entail? So, so, so the pharmacy benefit manager has, um, you know, just changed our drug program tremendously. Excellent. Number one, we're collecting rebates, which the program has never collected before. Wow. Rebates were something that could be... Rebates from the pharmaceutical rebates companies. Rebates from the pharmaceutical That's companies. That's incredible. So, so, you know, our drug spend, uh, we, you know, we're still collecting data and numbers and hopefully, you know, you'll have us back again and we can report on you know, the savings that we're going to be saving in collecting these rebates. Yeah, we want to hear about those savings. <laughs> we definitely uh, do. It, it, has, it has really, um, you know, improved our services in the drug. I don't get any calls anymore on medications and folks not being able to get their medications. I'm sure I know you work out of the commissioner's office. You guys used to receive, I don't know if you're receiving yeah, those types them. of calls No, anymore. not really, they've, they've died down. Exactly, yeah. so, so, so they've really, uh, the, the, the model that this pharmacy benefit manager focuses on is customer service. Amazing. There, there's a call center available for the, pharma for the pharmacies and the members. So they don't even have to call us anymore. They can call the, the, the call center um, to to be able to get whatever issue they have addressed. Everything's getting so streamlined now over here at Medicaid. This is great. So is so so that you know the the technology is so great. Yes. And 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 we we need to really take advantage of the available technology to improve our health care. It 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 it's it's based on technology being able to improve our health care, improve our outcomes. You know, um, RPM, a remote process monitoring, where you can monitor your, 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 the health of your members at their homes. When they're not doing what they're supposed to do, their physicians, you know, the FQHCs get notified as to, um, look, you know, you're not 
taken your medications or um, you know you you haven't taken your shot today so so those those are the areas that we want to focus into to, to improve our health care and also move to a more community based program where services can be available in the community and at people's homes um, cut down on those emergency room visits and and also assist while our hospitals and our healthcare infrastructure is being um, reconstructed and getting it back to where it was prior to the two Category 5 storms. That's all very good things to look forward to coming from this program, and you guys are doing an amazing job with it. I just have to ask you, Ms. Joseph, is there any additional things that you would like to um, add on to what Director Smith said? I would like to emphasize to the members and those that would want to come on the program please make sure if you're already an existing member, update your information. Um, I get a lot of calls that people will say, I didn't get the recertification. Mm. And when I ask them, what's the address? Because I tell them what I have. Oh, well, I have moved. We don't know that. Mm -hmm. So please update the information that you have, your phone number, your mailing address. Make any changes, bring it to the department so that we could keep you up to date and it helps us with the recertification process. Mm -hmm. Streamline faster that you don't have to wait because now you have expired, you need to get access to care and you have to put the whole application all over again because the system closed it out. Please update your information and I humbly ask for providers. You're the first point of contact that members come to. Encourage them to update their information at our office. Um, when it comes to getting a referral done because we do the referral process mm -hmm. make sure that you send a referral and you accompany it with the last clinical notes so that when our medical review team have to make a decision on it we have all the information up front so it can be streamlined faster to get you to the access of care that is needed for you at the department of human services we're all about the members and the community especially on medicaid getting access to care we know here in a territory we're limited with specialty providers and we do take you to the nearest point and if the nearest point which is Puerto Rico says they don't have a provider that can accommodate what's wrong with you we will go to the nearest other one which is going to be Florida right. which we do do business there understand that it is a process it's not drop the referral off today and you're gonna fly out tomorrow. Requires a little patience. It requires a little bit, and we understand that you're sick. We understand that you're in pain, and we're gonna get you out. But we do have to get a facility and a physician to accept your case, and that is where it is, because everyone is being bombarded with an uptick of mm. patients being critical. Right. And we will get you out. Um, if you fit the criteria, you're coming in, do the presumptive eligibility at the hospital. Keep your appointment, come in. And when you get your recertification, please fill it out and send it back in a timely manner so that my team can assist you fast. Yep. But we are here to serve. I really want to thank the both of you for coming today and sharing all of this information with us. Uh, I know for a fact that when it comes to our clients out there, uh, the two of you are not inaccessible at all. <laughs> uh, I've pointed individuals to you guys directly for help, and you guys have actually went out of your way personally and helped them, sometimes on your own personal time. And uh, th When it comes to health, uh, everyone is... is, is more better when we come collective as a community Correct. to solve the issues together yes. and i just i'm so glad that we had this chance to inform the virgin islands audience about the specific things that this program offers and the ways that it can help is there anything else you guys would like to say before we close out um i would like to say you know i what um beverly was just touching on i think that i'm going to put a plug in uh the next the next podcast you probably need to have Beverly and her team come and talk about care coordination and special services that's a date. and how that <laughs> process works because you know I think that that's important information for our members and yes. then our potential um, members to have and know and um, you know I hope that you know where we are welcome back to talk on other topics as there you is, are there is there, there is a lot that 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 we would like to share with, I'm with, a with the community. <laughs> we would like to share with the community uh, as part of our yes. um, 
you know, outreach and, and education to the Terry. And just want to, to, to thank you all for this opportunity um, as um, information sharing and education is most important. Yeah, this definitely will not be their first time on this podcast, and we will definitely have the two of you back for much more segments. Thank you so much. For your DHS, I'm Ryan Nugent. We are out.